Hello and welcome to the Check Out This Record podcast. My name is Frank and with me as always is my good buddy Mark. This is the podcast where we talk about all sorts of musical goodness. We review albums we've never heard of before. We will suggest albums to each other to review and we have a wide variety of musical discussions. You can check us out on Instagram and YouTube and if you like what we have to say, please feel free to give us a review and please only give us the reviews that are five star, right Mark? Yeah, that's right. You know, if uh, you can do more than five stars, I say do it. You know, maybe uh, a heart or a good old thumbs up. However the internet works these days, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I would enjoy the heart, actually, if that was an option. That, yeah, that was I an mean, option. Definitely take the heart, right? <laughs> like three hearts. Let's say I make this The Legend of Zelda. Just start me with three hearts and we'll go from there. Love it. Love because it. three hearts has to be more than five stars, right? It has to be. Absolutely. Heart, yeah. heart should be above the star, right? Right. Like, a, like a, I feel like a heart, one heart would be like 10 stars, maybe. Yeah. So I feel like that's fair. 10 stars. I feel- right. So everybody write this down. Yes. We need 30 stars at least, which is the equivalent to three hearts. Right? Yeah. We're making it easier for you guys by just clicking three hearts. That's it. Right. Right. Love, now, love if it. If there's an option for more, they should do more. Yes. Oh, okay. absolutely. Keep going, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh man well I, i'm excited uh about this mark you know we started a few episodes back uh which you guys can check out uh in the archive section uh we pitted green day's kerplunk versus offspring's ignition uh, now here we are this is the main event green day's dookie versus the offspring smash in fact at this very moment i don't even know which one i could say i like better will probably be decided as we are talking about it mark i, I know we talked about this offline but how excited for this are you right now uh, I am pumped, Frank, and if uh, if you know Frank and I, uh, you know that pumped is the extent of how excited I can get. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, we're pitted two icons of 1990s MTV alternative music against each other for uh, for our personal amusement, and um, you know, all joking about MTV and and 90s alt aside, like these are two, um, you know, for our generation certainly. Uh, bellwethers in terms of uh, yeah. punk rock and, and its impact it can have on on people and society. So this is um, this is pretty cool, man. It is. Uh, it's it's definitely exciting, and and I want to take everyone and of course Mark just back real quick. So it was the summer of '94, and every summer we would drive up from where we are right now in South Florida to my uncle's on Long Island, and we'd stay there for weeks. And, and I'd be in this guest room, and, and there was a tiny AM/FM radio. And one day I turned it on, and I, and I heard this bass line do 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 do, and that was probably off key. But what I, I and then I thought this guy was singing like almost in like a British accent and and the song was like Longview and and my mind was just totally totally blown away and then later that day I turned on MTV when it used to be a station about the music video and and Uh old old man rant I know and and the offsprings come out and play was on and again I was hooked and then I went to a place called Tower Records I picked up the compact cassettes or the tape or just the cassette and you know again I, I know we stated this before that we we're both introduced to these bands with these particular albums, but I say those memories because I'm curious, Mark, do you have any particular uh, memories about those two and the particular songs that you first heard from those albums? Yeah, uh, for me, you know, it was uh, a kid who lived in the same complex that I lived in uh, that let me dookie. Um, and, and it really just, it was one of those things. I took that blue cassette, put it in yeah. my wallet, and, and I spent probably the, the bulk of that summer riding my bike, listening to Dookie just over and over and over again. You know, Basket Case was just like the biggest thing in the world to me. Um, it was just really insane. And I think a lot like Frank, you know, uh, it was putting on MTV back when people could find new music on MTV uh, and hearing uh, The Offspring and then just running out and picking up uh, that tape as quickly as I could. Uh, yeah. Because those those two very much were – a big part of like my, my Walkman's, uh, you know, cause look, kids today don't understand every fucking song that your fingertips on their phone. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> especially back then, like I had a Walkman with like a pair of like the yellow fuzzy headphones uh, and like it. they, they went into where I'm supposed to put the pencils in my backpack and as many tapes as I could cram in there. So <laughs> like those two tapes were definitely in there. And then of course, like, you know, maybe a summer or two later, like everybody started getting the, the portable CD players. Yes. The Discman, as they were called, uh, and then stuffing the CDs in there. And, like, 
you know, that those cassettes, it, it wasn't like CDs where you could have like a whole book. And it certainly wasn't like today where you just fuck Google whatever you want. And every album you've ever wanted is at your fingertips. Right. Like, you had like, there was just a couple, you could only have so much on you. And, uh, and, and that was definitely a, those two records or tapes really back then were, were definitely there. There was a couple mixtapes. There was definitely Metallica's black album. i uh, pretty sure there was a Megadeth album. Like, as far as cassettes goes, those two uh, got probably the bulk of spins out of me. Yeah. And so funny, I remember the certain things too, right? The blue cassette. And literally, it's in my hand, just so you know, because uh, I know we posted it on the Instagram page. But that little blue cassette right now is currently uh, currently in my hand. And it's funny how those things stick with us for sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, on the Kerplunkin vs. Ignition episode, we did a background on the bands. And now – Let's get into kind of what happened after those two albums that led to Dookie and Smash. And if cool with you, my man, let's start with Green Day again, okay? For sure. So after the success of Kerplunk, many major labels were courting Green Day. Uh, the labels would try uh, to attempt to lure the band by taking them out to meals, and even one label – uh, invited him to Disneyland, which was funny. Um, they declined several offers, and then they met with producer and reprise representative Rob Cavallo. Uh, they connected with Rob uh, at he, as he's done previous work for a California band called The Muffs. I'm not too familiar with them. Um, they then left Lookout Records on friendly terms and signed with Reprise. And to this day, they're still signed to Reprise, which is which is remarkable. So there's a slight elephant in the room, Mark, and um, it's that's the shitty records they just put out. <laughs> that and <laughs> that's funny. That and for this time period, uh, the term selling selling out because the original fans of 924 Gilman Street, where they played, were pretty pissed and banned them from the club. Um, Mark, your thoughts on, on that whole sellout bit in, in regards, not in general, but in regards to Green Day? You know, uh, as a kid who um, grew up in the suburbs, um, I didn't give a shit. And I don't <laughs> give a shit. Like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I'd be interested uh, if we could find somebody from Gilman Street. Oh, to, that'd be uh, amazing. To sit down with us and, and, and talk about it. Like, what's the beef? What's the real beef? Yeah. Um, you know, like, because, you know, as far as anybody can tell that wasn't in the club, you know, it was, uh, it was three idiots plus um, that, that worked really hard on uh, writing some cool tunes. They like to get stoned and they went out and tore their asses off. Yeah. Um, and, and earned every bit of their success. So, I, I don't know, you know, it, it's interesting without knowing what their beef was to just, you know, like, who the fuck cares if they like, sold out, whatever the fuck that means. Like, right. You know, like, I don't know, man. No, I agree with you on that. And I'm going to do another old man rant, if you don't mind, of course. Um, no, go for it. So, all right. What is selling out? What does it really mean? It's a common expression. It's for compromising the per, a person's integrity, um, morality, authenticity, or principles in exchange for personal gain, i.e. money. So let's explore that, right? So most people would say that one of the reasons that people, not the reason maybe, but one of the reasons that a person starts a band is to become popular, right? Well, I mean, uh... or at least to get some appeal. I mean, to, to say that we start a band to become popular, I, I don't know that that's... But it could be one of the reasons, right, that they want to play in front of crowds, right? And to do so, you need to at least be attractive to people, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, where are you going with this? Okay, so what I'm saying is if a long-term career is what's yearned for, right, and the end goal is to play to big crowds and you need that sustainability, staying stagnant due to some like ethos or like you said, a, a person in Gilman Street who has a problem, it doesn't do a band any good. In fact, Green Day uh, never, if Green Day never appealed to the masses, maybe we wouldn't have found them, right? Sure. I mean, theoretically, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Sure. And, and let's dig, let's peel back another layer. So in 90, Billy Joe Armstrong, he met Adrian, who, who, eventually became his wife at one of Green Day's early performances in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They got married in July of 94. So the album came out on 94. And the day after the wedding, she was discovered, she discovered that she was pregnant with her first son. So of course, the idea of taking your band to the next level is something that you're going to want to do for the betterment of yourself and now your eventual child. So I don't know, to me, you know, listen, it's hard. Money's not 
easy to make. Me and you both know that. You throw in a family, it, it's, it becomes even maybe more complicated. So that's the reason why I'm taking that. I couldn't necessarily blame them for that. Now, musically, and we'll get to Dookie soon, but it sounds the same stylistically to me, it, it, very similar to the fact to the past two albums. In fact, uh, maybe one or two slower paced songs existed on those two albums. And the album was already written prior to them getting this deal they just needed to clean it up in fact we could really make an argument that they didn't really technically sell out until like good riddance came out you know three or what was that four four years later in 98 um so i don't know this could just be the case of the haves and the have nots i agree with you which that would be uh, unbelievable to really interview someone from gilman street and that's that's my rant <laughs> yeah no, so i think you, you make an interesting point right like um you know, when are we changing our music specifically um, to sell more records and, and not because we have something to say and not because we have something, yep. uh, you know, a point to make or uh, an, 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 an emotion to express. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that's it's kind of a muddy area, right? And, and punk rock is one of those it is. places in which, you know, selling out is a, a major taboo. But, you know... Um, I think at the same time we have to we have to really look at what that term means and and what bands do that we classify them as having sold out. And right. I think nine times out of ten, uh, I think this is a great example of Dookie's not a sellout record, especially. I mean, you know, as you said, they had the record uh, almost in the bag by the time they got the deal. Um, so why are they a sellout? Well, I think a few albums later when they need to figure out how to maintain this contract yeah. uh, and keep money coming. Cause now, now that you've had a little bit of money, you've bought a big house, you've got taxes to pay, you've got this, you've got that. And, and the upkeep on it is more when you're just a poor punk and nobody cares and you're just putting out enough records to, to tour the, the country to visit your friends, then you're not selling out. So it's one right. of those weird things. Um, you know, it, it, again, I'd be interested to see what the real beef was there that they were so offended that they banned them from playing. Yeah. And they just not want, you know, you and me, some suburban kids coming into the city, <laughs> uh, you know, smelling up their club. I, I don't know. Like, it's, yeah. it's such a weird world to think about. Like, I know. How, I think you how that important note. you have to be to, to exclude somebody for for being successful. Yeah. I, I think you, I think you nailed it. There's gotta be like something more to that. And, and uh, maybe you and me will pay, play um, investigators and, and one day figure that out. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, let's, let's get then to the facts of the album. Um, so we have Dookie. Here we go. So the lineup, Billy Joe Armstrong, Mike Dirt, Trey Cool. That's the same lineup as the previous record, released February 1st of 94 on Reprise Records. It spawned five singles, Longview, Basket Case, Welcome to Paradise, although I think that was a live video, When I Come Around, and She, which was a radio-only single. Uh, the album went gold in June of 94 and reached platinum status in September of 94, and it has the coveted diamond certification for sales of at least $10 million. Um, We know a lot about the legacy of the album, of course. It you know, filled a gap maybe for some with Nevermind uh, or what Nevermind did for grunge, but maybe in a little bit more of a sustainable way. Uh, so many pop punk bands eventually had careers because of this album. Offspring obviously gets popular. Rancid gets uh, major label attention, although they don't go that way. Uh, Bad Religion. Um, before we go track by track into Dookie, I mean, that's pretty impressive, right, Mark? I mean, does, reaching platinum status, eventual diamond certification, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, nowadays those things aren't even uh, I know. a thing. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, those, those certifications. But it, it's certainly, again, you know, definitely um, uh, a bellwether of the time, right? Like, uh, uh, this record was very much a predecessor to a lot of really amazing things that came out. 94 is a phenomenal year. Oh my God. In punk rock. Uh, Beautiful. So many great records that came out that year. Um, and for this to be one, uh, and we'll get into it as, as we get into the record, like the fact that some of these songs were hits is fucking amazing. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it, it really spoke to the, the changing tide, you know? Um, I certainly think, you know, the, the, what, uh, Nirvana and Nevermind did yeah. for rock and roll can't, can't really be understated. You know, they saved us, uh, in my thinking, uh, from 80s hair metal, living yes. on boring assault to death. Um, 
this record uh, is very much a part of that curve as music uh, begins to steer away from that uh, homogeny and yeah. into really expressive things. This album was was one of those ones that that showed people like there are other things. There's there's more depth, and you know I think that phrase alternative gets thrown around way too much. Yep. Um, but you know that's I think it's it's fair to argue that this falls into that category certainly for the times. Um, but but what it did for you know punk rock albums after that, what it did for for mainstream music after that, just can't be. Um, understated I, you know yeah i'm trying I'm, not, I'm trying not to talk myself into saying that this is a better record um, <laughs> and it's, it's not because i think smashes it's because i'm so undecided they're both just really i bad. know it's tough man this really is um yeah. you can get things like the the cover i'm looking at the cover now too it made me laugh with the whole diarrhea theme you know it, it said that the the band uh would joke about this because they when they went on tour, uh, they would eat because they were so poor. They would eat spoiled food, so that was kind of like their in, their inside joke. And the original title was supposed to be Liquid Dookie, but they felt that was a little too gross. And an interesting fact here is on the back cover, and I'm looking at it, um, mm-hmm. and the early prints. I don't know if you remember, but in the crowd there was someone holding Ernie from Sesame Street, but eventually it was airbrushed out, so it wouldn't be confused with a kid album. <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting, only because I I totally remember that. I just, it's funny that somebody would have assumed it was a kid's album. Yeah. Yeah. And last um, night uh, when I was, uh, I was like in a Barnes and Noble and I saw you know, like a remastered you know, version of, of on vinyl of Dookie and I turned it around, there's no Ernie, but in my tape here, there's Ernie. So uh, interesting, interesting little fact. Um, and we have lots of cool themes here, you know, anxiety, panic attacks, which <laughs> we all know about that. Uh, mm-hmm. Masturbation, boredom, mass murder, divorce, uh, you know, if you want to dive right in, man, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, the album opens uh, with Burnout. Yeah. Uh, I love the intro, right? We're just going to get right into this record. We're just going to we're set this breakneck pace right off the start. Uh, plus, you know, a, a rarity in punk rock. You get a, a really cool drum solo in this song. And, like, mm-hmm. especially for the first track, you don't get that kind of that kind of buildup. Um, I love what this, this does for – getting the record off the ground. Yeah. Uh, just really cool. Fun song. Um, great opening track. What'd you think? Yeah. Great classic sounding green day here. Um, you know, we talk about that opening punch, right? This has it. It's relatable lyrics. I'm not growing up. I'm just burning out. And I stepped in line to walk amongst the dead. The breakdown is really cool. And then brings us back to the chorus. You can't get better with this for an opening track. And I know I you agree. And you agree. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. We're like, wait, wait, what? Um, number two, having a blast. I think this is actually one of, in my opinion, one of the more unheralded tracks uh, from Green Day in general. The, the chorus is on the chords when he moves to that B chord, that, that just gets me. And there's not much in the way of live footage on this track, but, but I love this song. Now, in this song, he's basically taking everyone out via explosives and does not advocating obviously for some of that topic matter, but I think it's lighthearted between the title and the melody. It's not meant to be taken seriously. At least I don't personally think it is. Um, I, I think again, it's a, one of those under the radar type tracks, Mark. Yeah, I agree. I was really surprised in looking back. I don't know if this was just me absolutely loving the song. Yeah. Um, but I, I was surprised it wasn't a single. Like looking back, I could have sworn it was a single because uh, it's just such a fun, you know, like I, I love the, the fast palm muting on it. It's really yeah. on point. Uh, the hook is killer. Um, it's just a great song. I was just so surprised it wasn't a single. It really blew me away. And then you lead into something like Chump. Chump. Um, you know, the third track, uh, I love the anger of this song. It really builds off that. This this album does a great job of like kind of like uh, giving you a left and then a right, like just really setting you up and knocking you down. Uh, and these two tracks do that really well because uh, it's just angry. It's just punk as fuck. Uh, <laughs> and it really spoke to the adolescent rage. We all feel towards... Um, things we don't understand, right? Yeah. Which is very much an adolescent feeling and, and something, you know, we probably feel a little too much today and that like that anger towards things we don't understand. And this was just a great um, understanding of that and like an understanding that you're the problem and not the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's very, I liked, I really liked the way you put it. And, and live when I would see this song, um, not in concerts, but on TV when like they would be playing them a lot. Uh, I always viewed this as, Oh, this is the song that leads into Longview, you know, and people, they right. would erupt when, when people would play it. Um, 
but it's a it's another one of those where I've come to appreciate it a lot because of those things that that you said. Uh, musically, it's another classic sounding Green Day song, nice full punk song, full of you know, full of energy. The chords ring out, and I do of course like that musical build up uh, almost uh yeah it, it's really just a nice build up into here we go longview which is the the first single named after longview washington where the song was first performed in 92 uh, this i feel is what hooked a lot of people uh it's a catchy bass riff it captures your attention right away lyrics of boredom smoke and dope add in a little masturbation along with those slow verses and a build up to a loud chorus you have a really really great tune almost paralleling it dare I say, to like smells like Teen Spirit, where the verses are calm and then the chorus gets big, big and loud. The video is great. Uh, I think over the, my opinion, Mark, uh, tell me what you think too about this. I think over the years, it may get, it may get lost. It may, excuse me, get lost a little bit with their other hits. Um, I, maybe, I don't know, maybe because uh, Basket Case was such a huge hit when I come around and everything after that too. Um, and I know the way they positioned this live, it's always kind of like one of the first hits, real big hits that they play early on. But I absolutely love Longview. Mark? Yeah, you know, who says you can't make a hit single out of uh, getting stoned and jerking off? <laughs> um, no, you're right. The song's really cool, man. You know, it, it's got that fun kind of groove intro to it. Um, and it just it just takes you in like, um, you know, surprisingly good su- lyrics for getting stoned and jerking off and, and being too paranoid to leave your house. Um, totally. You know, it just really, it, it was definitely one of those, uh, the songs that just pulled you right in. And, um, you know, like with that said, welcome to paradise. Yeah. Uh, holy fuck. Does this song hold up, dude? Um, growing up, uh, isn't as cool as we had hoped it would be. And, uh, and Billy Joel Armstrong nailed that in this song. Whew. Uh, musically still punk as fuck. Yeah. Uh, the breakdown is great. Um, you know, that, that kind of walking baseline still totally kicks ass. Yeah. Um, you know, this was, this was just a great song, a great, um, you know, like this is 1994, just like stamped right in the earth, like a flag, uh, on the moon. Like this, this, this just really was just such a great song that, um, uh, you know, really should just be one of their signature sounds. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason that the hype is real. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And of course, we know this appeared on Kerplunk, but it wasn't polished. We hear, now get the more polished version. It's a great sounding song. Uh, it's another single from Dookie, which I don't, for some reason, and I'm sure I, I was around for it, but I, I just, I, I don't remember the live video because it was a video of a live performance of theirs getting a, a lot of rotation. Um, but um, again, very polished from Kerplunk. Uh, the, the chorus, they even do a little bit more on the harmonies. Um, the bass line's cool, as Mark said. I agree totally with that. Then we get uh, Pulling Teeth, which I think is another uh, under-the-radar song, and I've rarely seen live performances of this. Just bright-sounding open chords, nice harmonies. Lyrically, for some reason, it reminded me of the movie Misery with James Conn and Kathy Bates. <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, I think because there's a little bit of, of, of that type of content in there. But I don't know. I, I, I like this song. I always blare it out really loud, and I like Pulling Teeth. Well, what about you, Mark? Yeah, this looking back, this is definitely one of the lower points on the record for me. Okay. Not that it's a bad song in any way. It it just doesn't hold up the way the rest of the record does. I totally see your um, misery, <laughs> your, your misery. Yeah, your your misery reference there. It, it, it works. I mean, that's that's kind of what it's about, right? And yeah, I think he he revisits this theme again later and does just kind of a better job with it mm-hmm. uh, in she. Um, mm. So, you know, yeah. content wise, you know, we're looking at 15 tracks. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the last track is, is more or less a joke <laughs> and um, all by myself. Right. But but nonetheless, um, you know, I, I feel like when it comes to the topics of it uh, and and Billy Joel Armstrong's, um, you know, we touched a little bit on it uh, with the last with Kerplunk. Yeah. Um, his. His views towards women and his. Um, issues with them and his self-deprecating nature, which is surprising how much it comes up in Smash as well. Um, It's on display here, and and it's a well-written song. To me, it just doesn't hold up as well as the rest of the album does. Gotcha, gotcha, absolutely. And now you lead us into Basket Case, right? Right, which is, um, you know, this is the song that started off for me. (laughs) Um, Still a great song. Um, 
uh, I don't know that it's the best song on the album. Um, right. It's smart. It's witty. Um, you know, it gets fast. It gets in your face. You know, this was definitely that, that music video of them pushing around Trey in the wheelchair. I can still very much see that. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it holds up. Um, but I think uh, in terms of the album, uh, as a whole, uh, it's no like, whereas if you had caught me in 1996 and said, what was the best, uh, song on this album or even 94, I'd have told you it was basket case all day. Right. Um, there's a lot more depth to this record than this song. Um, and, and I'm in no way trying to put the song down cause it's still a cool ass song. It just doesn't, uh, live up to all the great shit on the rest of this record. What did you think? It's the second. It's the second song I heard from them after Longview. Uh, some may argue this catapulted them um, and is really like the superior, more popular track than Longview. And and I, you know, I, listen. I like that we're talking about anxiety and panic uh, musically. I think it's cool because you kind of you got get, you get that intro with Billy Joel. Uh, Billy Joe, gosh, not Billy Joel. My bad, Billy Joe. Well, I think I've said it like four times too. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and the guitar, and I like that. I kind of like that. And uh, then you get the classic Green Day punk sound. However, though, I agree with you because then looking back, I I think there's way more uh, depth on this album, and I I happen to like Longview a little bit better as as the single. Um, but I mean, Basket Case though. It, it, it catapulted them then I think at the time into another stratosphere, especially with having just released in Longview prior to that. It was like boom, one classic song right after another. Uh and now we could look back, you know, X amount of years later still saying it's classic. So I agree with you on that. Um yeah, I hope I like Longview better than a uh, basket case as far as a single goes, but um still good still a good tune. Absolutely. Then we get into She. Uh, this was the radio-only single from the album, uh, usually live um, in the mid to late 90s. This was positioned very late onto their set list, um, which tells you what they thought about it also. It's a sensitive tune, I think, without being soft and wimpy. The lyrics, I think, are well-crafted. It's fast-paced. It's got that intensity. You could even hear them screaming kind of in the song. Um, I, mean, I love She, man. What about you? Yeah, I think this is... Um I think this is his best work on the record. Yeah. Um, lyrically, uh, you know, it's simple. Um, very, very. But at the same time, really poignant. You know, she she screams in silence. Just his ability to use metaphor, to use um, uh, lyrics as as part of the art form are really showcased here. Uh, and I think it's it's one of the, the best works on the record. Uh, yeah. Musically, it delivers. Like, it's kind of fun. You know, this to me is... Um, uh, is, is a is just a great track, and I love how it leads into Sassafras Roots. Yeah, uh, which to me is kind of like um, the love song on the album, like the only one that's actually kind of like really um, pro love, uh, especially after kind of a self deprecating song like she. Yeah, um, you know, I love the the bass line just kind of like bops around, and like this song is is really kind of fun, um, with in in kind of a different uh, way. Um, musically than the rest of the album. It, it doesn't do the same uh, structure. It's got more of a, a, a bubbly attitude towards it. And I really, I really dig it. What'd you think? Yeah. So in, in my research, this song is about the same girl as she and chump, which is kind of cool. Cause it's almost like a, you know, a trifecta you get on this album about mm -hmm. the same person, but in different ways to me, I know I've said this now the third time, right? But it's another unheralded track on the album. I, yeah, I, I, I can't find many live performances of it. Uh, it's simple. It's fun. It's got that really common chord progression, uh, like you know, in Blitzkrieg, Bob, you know, by the Ramones, the A D to the E. Um, but oh yeah, of course, yeah. They they delay it though a little bit, a little bit longer, and just really make it their own. Again, another unheralded track. When that thing comes on, I I, uh, I blare it loud. Uh, you know, windows down, and it's it's a great and enjoyable tune for me. So another unheralded one. I agree with you on that. Of course, we get into a really big one right now, uh, When I Come Around, perhaps the most universal tune uh, in the sense where many people who listen to all types of music, at least during that time frame, they knew about it. Uh, for for me, it was one I recognized early on when, when you're like listening to the tape because it was slower pace, we had palm muted tempo, it stuck out for sure. Crossed it crossed that line, I think, with the punk and alternative rock, maybe something you were saying a little bit earlier. It was our third straight number one single and their second best single of the 90s behind Good Riddance, The Time of Your Life. Uh, it's a classic nonetheless. It still holds up. Um, 
Mark, when I come around, your thoughts? Yeah, I love, uh, I love the fact that they were willing to slow down for this one. Uh, this might be my favorite single off the record. Um, you know, and I love the line, uh, you know where I'll be found when I come yeah. around. Like, I kind of love that, like, um, that, that attitude of, like, uh, I'll get there when I get there. Like, it, it's about me. It's not about you. Um, and I, I just really like the, the approach of this song and kind of like the, the way they can hide being snarky in a really pop song. <laughs> Um, I, I just love it. Like it's, it's one of my favorite singles off the record. Um, you know, and going into coming clean, Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is just kind of another great tune about growing up. Um, again, we found a little bit of repetition in the the themes of the songs on the album, but I mean, that's going to happen. You've got 15 songs and and about five themes. You're going to get Frank breathing really heavy into his microphone. (laughs) Um, no, but when you get, you know, uh, when you have three to five themes and 15 songs, you're going to get, you know, a couple of those that repeat and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a sign of good songwriting. You know, it's like somebody saying like you painted in blue too many times on these paintings. Um, so it coming clean, just a kind of another fun, like classic green day song. Um, I wouldn't call it a filler track, but, um, if I had to pick out a few from this album that, that felt like filler to me, this would be one. But again, there's nothing wrong with this song. <laughs> the only thing wrong was just my, my heavy breathing in there. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened. But <laughs> so, so actually this, and I'll get to the point in Smash when we talk about it, but I think people might be able to figure it out. But there are a lot of parallels with these two albums. And one is after around the ninth or tenth track, then you get, Again, not to say fillers, but you get into maybe some of the lesser known tracks. This is one of them. Um, it, it's it's good. It's a good song. It just compared to the rest of the album, it, it's tough. It almost pales in comparison. But this and the next couple ones are short and punchy. Uh, none of them clocking, believe it or not, anywhere near uh, to two minutes. Uh, still fun. I'll sometimes you know, skip over this one, but it you know it's not a bad tune. Uh, next one is Enemus Sleep. That, the lyrics are actually written by the bass player Mike. Uh, again, similar to what I said previously with Coming Clean, a short kind of punchy song, still fun, nowhere near the, st- the other stuff on the album. Mark, your, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I really liked uh, the use of harmonies on this. Uh, I really just enjoyed it. Um, you know, the um, uh, another song to me that that could have been uh, a hit, maybe if it were a little longer, you know, I think that, ah, that plays into, um, yeah. you know, what, what they make decisions on when it comes to single and are we going to make a video for it and so on and so forth. I just really like it. It's, it's kind of that, that prototypical green day that I just enjoy. And I think Frank really kind of nailed it. You know, the, the, not the back half of these records, but certainly like the, the, the latter quarter of them, um, you know, needed to fill a certain amount of time and, and they were able to do it, but uh, I think it was a great song, you know, in the end, uh, the next track uh, is just kind of a little bit of that same in that it's it's just kind of a, a fun, catchy tune that, uh, you know, take it or leave it, it's it's there. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it's a good foreshadow of um, some of what we would see from the band later. Um, what do you think of In the End? Yeah, I, th- I think it's the third of the trilogy of songs that kind of almost resemble each other to me. Uh, this one's faster paced. Um, it was not much in the way of live performances on this track, which which sometimes for me make it difficult because then I could be like, oh, wait a minute, there's there's you know they perform this amazing live. It's a better track live. There's more energy. They do a couple of different things here to talk about it, um, but there's not much really to reference uh, but with this song and the kind of the previous two again, fun, faster pace under two minutes, but you know, it's not a bad track again, just a little paling in comparison to the other stuff. Uh, then we get the, the ending here, F O D where we get Billy with the guitar for about a minute and 35 seconds. I've always liked the let's nuke the bridge. We torched 2000 times before. I always thought it was catchy. It's angry. There's that build up to that anger. Um, I think it's a it's a great closing track on, of course, an amazing album asterisk though because there is something after this. But Mark, your thoughts on F O D? Yeah, you know, I I think uh, this is some more of uh, Billy Joe's uh, best work on the the album lyrically. I do like the extended um, acoustic bit. Like instead of just using it for a single verse and chorus, he plays it out a little longer, uh, and it builds really cool into just that great blaring guitar and drum sound. Um, I think it's a great way to end the record. 
Um, uh, especially after a song called In the End. I kind of love that, like, that fuck you <laughs> yeah. or something after that. Because um, it, it just has a great feel to it. And, and that line, uh, absolutely. Right. Uh, you know, uh, we'll torch the bridge we torch 2,000 times before and blow it all to hell. Like, yeah. it, it's just a great, especially when you look at the cover, you look at the bombs, you look at the mayhem. Um, it's really interesting um, and just a great way to do it. And then, of course, um, you know, the hidden track, as it were, um, All By Myself. Yeah. Uh, I loved it as a kid. Um, <laughs> I, I don't necessarily need it now. Um, I think it's smarter than uh, certainly my mom gave it credit for when this record came out. Um, you know, it's 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 on the creepy side, but at the same time, between the giggling and the um, and the stuttering on the record, you know, I, I think they know that they're not serious. The the listener knows that they're they're goofing off, um, and it's you know it's it is what it is. It's you know I know I so, know. Yeah, I, I always view this as like the short cousin, cousin of Dominated Love Slave, you know, and uh, for uh, those people younger than us, if you left your CD or if you let your tape go, you would start hearing all these weird sounds and you had Trey Cool with this simple little guitar riff. Uh, it's fun, it's cute, but no complaints. You know, those hidden tracks back in the day were always, always fun to discover. Um, you know, really no complaints here, you know, at the end of the day. Um <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, what can we say with this album? You know, its impact was massive. It filled the void, as I said, for me personally, an open exposure to all these other bands. It was a gateway. Uh, this was the talk of the summer hell of that year. I mean, we had Woodstock 94, where millions saw them perform. And of course, the mud just made them and the album even bigger. I don't feel it compromised to anything. The band kept true to who they were. And through their hard work, they deserved to bump up the chain. And, and hell, they, I mean, they made a great, great record i don't blame them at all that backlash would ultimately lead to the following album insomniac my personal favorite from them which is being angry pissed and heavy and although youngsters can have their american idiot to claim as green day's best work this is where it's at for me mark uh did i miss anything there <laughs> you know i think you nailed that review like a split hog frank nice, um, nice. But seriously uh this to me is still uh green day's best record uh it holds up surprisingly well i think um you know, I, I, I personally kind of like tried to set nostalgia aside and really be critical with this album. And I did the same with Smash. Um, this thing holds up fucking so well. It's <laughs> so well. It's kind of weird. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a great record. Um, you know, people who want to say that they sold out at this point, I think may have been premature. Or, or hey, look, maybe they saw the writing on the wall and knew that, you know, uh, maybe we got Insomniac because of them. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, maybe they saw, you know, the rest of it coming. Maybe they saw American Idiot and uh, Time of Your Life uh, in, in, down the road and, and wanted to say something to warn us. But, hey, look, uh, <laughs> this record was awesome. Um, uh, you know, it, it has a, a personal feeling, but it's still punk as fuck. Yeah. Um, I, I really dig it, man. I, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that by the end of uh, Smash that I still feel this way and I can call an easy winner because... Uh, I know that that's going to be a really hard. I know. I'm still, I'm still on the side, man. <laughs> it's going to make it hard. Oh boy. All right. Well, uh, speaking of smash, let's get into then you know, the offspring. So, uh, although the, these two albums, they share similarities with each band's third release and the breakout album, there were different paths to get there. So we previously talked about how Brett Gruitz from Bad Religion and Epitaph Records felt the offspring weren't pronounced enough for his label, which in hindsight, isn't that funny, Mark? You thought the offspring weren't good enough for the label? <laughs> hey, you know, um, I've heard some of those latter Bad Religion albums. I don't know where he gets off uh, <laughs> saying anything about anybody else's music. Um <laughs> says the guy who's made one 15 minute record in his life. Um, yes. but you know, it's, it, it certainly is interesting. Um, you know, uh, when it comes again to writing on the wall, maybe he saw Americana coming, <laughs> you know, maybe he saw, those, I don't know. Um, it, it, it's certainly an interesting dynamic. I, <laughs> he saw pretty fly for a white guy. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, I, I'd be interested to know, you know, what else, what else was he turning down? What else, was going on. Um, yes. Yes. You know, who else were they talking to? Was was there another option on the board? Was you know? Um, I think there's probably a little bit more of a, a story there. Um, it's interesting either way. Uh, I'd definitely be interested to know. Uh, yeah. 
you know, what, what made him feel that way? Cause it just kind of feels like he saw the band and went, yeah, I don't know. Um, but you know <laughs> what? I, I also don't have like a massively successful band slash record label. Um, and, and can't really, you know, like who knows if, if I would have picked some winners and who knows what bands I would have told to go fuck off. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of bands that I think can go fuck off that have uh, huge fan bases uh, and have put out, you know, uh, theoretically massive re- records yeah. uh, that I think are just absolute garbage. So to yeah, it's, it's, and, yeah. yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. So, well, after we interview the person from nine twenty four Gilman street, we'll, we'll go in a uh, uh, court Brett to come on so that he can really tell sure. us. Um, so after Ignition, uh, they, they toured uh, and they began writing new material um, where the intent with Green Day's Dookie was major label and of course more of an appeal. There, there was no intent here. Dexter actually states in an interview in 94 when they recorded Smash, their last album sold for about 15,000 copies. So the possibility of them getting played on the radio was pretty much non-existent and the budget was super small. It was 20,000, which created restrictions to the band. They had to constantly call the studio to find out when it wasn't occupied so they could record. Um, I, I forgot what I was watching, Mark, maybe you could help me remember, but it was um, Fletcher from Pennywise talking about how they were hanging out with the offspring and Dexter was like, yeah, Brett thinks we have like a song on the radio and they, and they all laughed at him. <laughs> so there's two totally different paths here, but similar results. Uh, Mark, your, your take on that and kind of what offspring got to go through. Uh, you know, Hey, look, uh, it takes a lot to put a record together. Yeah. Uh, um, it's a lot of foresight. It's a lot of thinking. Um, you know, I would assume a band uh, as smart as the offspring had a lot of material ready uh, after ignition, getting ready to record smash. Um, you know, uh, I'd be interested to see what they presented, uh, Brett, that he felt that there was maybe uh, a radio, uh, single there. Yeah. Clearly there were, um, I believe, you know, and, and, and I remember in that same thing, and as I cut you off was, it was self-esteem. So continue, but I think self-esteem yeah. is what, yeah, attracted Brett there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, you know, that song speaks for itself and we'll certainly get into that. And of course, Fletcher from Pennywise is, uh, notoriously an asshole, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and aside from two, maybe three records, they've put out, uh, you know, six or seven piles of trash. Um, you know, I, I used to be a huge Pennywise fan. I know. I remember. And as you really get into Pennywise, as you look at what they're doing and what they're trying to say and, and the ethos of the band and what it all means, it's, it's all kind of bullshit. Um, which is too bad because, you know, on the, on the surface, they're this awesome punk rock, uh, middle finger to the world, uh, that's about making the world a better place. And, um, they just use the, the opportunity to act like fucking bitches, uh, which is too bad because, um, you know, they they really wrote some great music out of, uh, the death of their original bass player, whose name's going to escape me right now. Jason Matthew Thursk. Yeah, there you go. How did I forget that? Um, you know, like I, I learned how to play punk rock by, joining a band and learning how to play Broham. Yeah. Like, like that was like the thing that got me into it. And, and I think Frank will tell you that that style pretty much never changed uh, for me. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, uh, you know, music is such a personal thing. The way we perceive it's such a personal thing. Totally. Um, you know, and hey, maybe it's having done this podcast a little bit and really, really trying to get deeper into records and, and suss out what they're, what they're really trying to tell us that makes me go like, who the fuck are you? Yeah. Um, especially after they've put out some garbage fucking records. So, um, I mean, probably mind you at 94 though, they were probably still pretty, they, I, I hadn't, I don't hate them yet. Yeah. Um, and you know, um, it's too bad that tragedy would be what it takes to make them a decent band. And then that they would forget that and just turn into fucking assholes again. So, yeah. Um, but as far as the offspring goes though, I mean, <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's definitely some foreshadowing into some of the poppier stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, this record fucking kicks ass, man. Just I know. Start with Time to Relax. Well, let's get a uh, quick facts real quick. So we have, oh, yeah, sure. yeah, we have Dexter Holland, we have Noodles, we have Greg K, Ron Welty. That's the lineup. Released April 8th, 
1994 on Epitaph Records, spawned four singles, Come Out and Play, Self-Esteem, Gotta Get Away, and Bad Habit, Radio Only, which is funny. Um, it was the first Epitaph release to gain gold and platinum status. It sold over 11 million copies worldwide and is certified six times platinum. And here's the most impressive stat. It's the best-selling album released on an independent label ever, ever. And if you Google that exact phrase, Smash comes out. So Brett stated in an interview that um, Epitaph was just a small operation with a few people. The success of Smash not only turned it into a legitimate record label, but basically caused him to depart Bad Religion and focus on his company. Again, it caused him to leave Bad Religion and focus on his company. It's crazy to think of that success from Smash. It was not expected at all. Uh, the cover is an ominous uh, distorted skeleton that we see the theme here uh, in the videos as well. It said that the skeleton represents the motives of the album, which is death, greed, suicide, violence, addiction. Uh, it's representation that's a continuation in, in these um, acts that ultimately to them, they said, led to death anyway. Uh, the artwork is done by the same people who actually designed Bad Religion's Recipe for Hate. So, um, Something to keep in mind, too, with the previous themes. They're a little bit heavier, I think, than and severe than we get on, on Dookie. So, yeah, time to relax. Listen, this is when you were putting in CDs and you get that those little intros, and I'm going to do it. And it's, ah, oh, it's time to relax. You know what that means? A glass of wine, your favorite easy chair. And, of course, this compact disc, so it's dated a little bit, right, mm-hmm. playing on your home stereo. So go on, indulge yourself. That's right. Kick off your shoes, put up your feet, lean back, and just enjoy the melodies. After all, music soothes even the savage beasts. A little bit dated, but Mark, I mean, it's funny, right? <laughs> it's great. Well, and 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 it, it really works, especially as a setup for Nitro. Um, you know, I, I love that you ho- did the whole bit. I hope you do the one in the middle, um, <laughs> because because what we're talking about here, right, is is preparing the listener, and that's one of those things. You know, the intros and the clips and the um, you know quotes from movies and stuff like that, that happens throughout punk rock everywhere. Um, this was them creating a soundscape, right? You were now, not, you didn't just hit play on a, on a CD. You, you committed yourself to this world that they were. Yes. Playing. Yeah. Um, and it was a really cool device at the time that, I mean, it's, it's still a really cool device today. It still totally works. It, it, Frank's right. It does date itself a little bit by saying compact disc, but at the same time, what it did then was, you know, especially if you bought this one right when it came out, <laughs> um, it puts you on the cutting edge of technology of what is happening. So right. it was a really interesting thing, especially for them. Yeah. Now, obviously it's a little dated, um, but it certainly works to, to just like with green day to just, plant that flag and go, this is what's going on right now, right here. This is, you know, LA 1994. Yeah. Um, you know, like this album is an Aries and don't fuck with it. Like, <laughs> uh, cause it's just a cool way. And then of course to get into fucking nitro, yep. uh, youth energy, yeah. uh, this song fucking rules, dude. Oh, um, it's, it's angry as fuck, but, but it's still positive. Right. And that's, um, that's what Pennywise could never do. Right. I'm just like, so angry at Fletcher right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's got this intensity and it's got this drive for what can punk rock do to make the world better. Um, yeah. It's taking the negativity and it's it's pushing it away and trying to do something better and and talking to the youth specifically and saying, hey, now is your time. Yeah, the gun's on you, but you can get ahead of it. You can do something about it. And it's just a phenomenal way to open a record. I love the, the uh. one, two, bang, bang um, of setting that soundscape and then really just punching the listener right in the mouth. Um, just absolutely love Nitro. What, I'll, I'll, let, I'll stop rambling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, much like with Dookie, we get a classic style song of the band, and that's that's what Nitro, where Burnout talked about being, well, burned out and perhaps disconnected. Nitro is saying, you might be gone before you know, so live like there's no tomorrow. Um, it's just, it's heavier. It's heavier, and like you said, it, it's, it, it points it directly at the youth, where at that age, hey, we're not thinking about that, but, you know, now here are me and Mark in our respective ages, and we're you know at the time we're like, well, we kind of wish we were thinking about that. Uh, great blistering guitars, lightning paced, solid, solid overall intro track in so many which ways. So Mark, I'm with you on that. I I think it's it's beautiful. I absolutely love it. Um, 
go into Bad Habit, which is a high spot on the album for me. This was performed on their first TV performance on the Billboard Music Awards. Uh, it's a cool performance, so I suggest you check it out today. If the song was released today, I could only imagine how butthurt it would make people. It's angry, it's pissed, and um, it's a it's a great set list opener too, with a, that brooding bass line and that you know in comes that that scraping guitar sound. Again, fast paced guitars. I don't think it's meant to be taken seriously. Uh, it's your know, road rage. I get it. It's much like kind of the having the blast version, um, you know, that we saw in, in uh, Dookie. Uh, I've always liked this, and I always like that lyric that I feel like I'm God, because uh, that's you know, I'm sure what people go through in in those scenarios. Um, Mark, bad habit. I, I love it. Yeah, you know, as far as songs about being angry go, this song still kicks ass. Yeah, it really um, does. It, it's a great, like, get out your energy, get out your anger, uh, sit in your car and yell uh, before you go into work so because you know you're going to have a miserable day. Um, you know, it does, and Frank was talking about me, it does come off a little childish when you really kind of just look at the lyrics for what they are on, the, on face value. Uh, but when you look at what Road Rage was about then, um, and yeah. what a... What a epidemic it was people killing each other over traffic um you know it it was a serious issue and you know uh we've all felt that like hey look i'm trying to get where the fuck i'm going what are you doing in my way fuck you god damn it yep um and this song it's you know for for as much as i want to say like oh it can come off childish it's still fucking badass yeah fuck um yeah and then you work into a song like gotta get away uh, which is probably my song, my favorite song on the album now. Yeah. Um, probably one of the most personal on the album uh, when it comes to dealing with mental health. Um, I, I just love this song. I, I love, like, um, I don't remember this as a single. Do, do you? Like, I, I, do, I do. I do. But go continue, though. I don't remember it that way. Um, I remember it being like, just like this awesome spot on the record, especially right after Bad Habit, because you've, you've got to really just carry, you know, we're only at the fourth... That really the third song of the record um but you you've really got a you've got a whole record to go you've got to keep this energy going because you just had um nitro then you have bad habit and you've just got to keep this this energy and this intensity going and i think uh gotta get away uh it's just a phenomenal job of just carrying that energy yeah super high point for me the, this is a song that when i immediately heard the album I was like, oh, this is. I was like, this is good. Uh, I remember also to my cousin in Jersey when he's like, you got to check out the Offspring Smash. It's amazing, and he played me "Got to Get Away," um, and I was like, oh, I was like, man, I was like, this, this is a tune and a half. And I do remember it being as a single. Believe it or not, though, it wasn't. It wasn't as popular, and I think it's just due to positioning. I think because yeah, come out and play, then you had self esteem, and I really think it was just. Uh, it was just because of that sequencing right there. Uh, it speaks of Dexter's pressure to finish the album on time. Uh, and of course with, you know, the demons in my head and you know, the, the whole mental aspect of it. I love it. It's catchy. If you see a performance, um, more recently on, on YouTube, you get the new drummer, Pete Parada, who I mentioned in the previous, uh, offspring and green day episode. I, I think he's a fantastic, uh, drummer. Uh, so he really, really hits, hits the drums hard on that. Uh, I love it. It's catchy as hell. Um, yeah, love that. Love that song today. I still love it. Uh, I got my girl singing it. So it's, it's really a good song. Um, genocide the, you know the intro riff reminds me of bad religions anesthesia which is my favorite bad religion song typical offspring here fast guitars fast drumming good song it grows on you um you know it may have been one i might have glossed over in the early days but definitely now i i, I listen to it a lot mark genocide yeah I, I absolutely love this intro that like that fast palming palm muting into the drums into the whole band kicking in just this build up that really explodes and, and really um, to me, the offspring embracing their, their, you know, classically trained punk rock ethos, uh, of that struggle to change the world, knowing it's a futile act. Um, yeah. you know, I, I really love that they're able to, um, to convey that in a, in a way that's, that's real, um, but still optimistic of, of still understanding that struggle and still trying to, to move forward in a way I, I absolutely love, uh, genocide and I love the way. Uh, it builds into something to believe in because just like Green Day had kind of a one-two punch, this, these two songs for me, uh, really, we talk about just kind of uh, ramping up the intensity, ramping up uh, what's going on with this, something to believe in um, just, just builds so awesomely that that big old chorus, I believe that reality is gone, delusion rules. Um, 
you know, just speaking to that, that dismal world of how, you know, in the nineties we were these, um, these very materialistic people, uh, that we like to look back and say, Oh no, that was the eighties. Like, no dude, like here he is. He's talking about it in the nineties of people just being, uh, vapid and void um and needing something uh, um and being that something for yourself um I, I just absolutely love this song man song's so cool yeah it's grown on me over the years uh, i like the palm muted guitar during the verse and it's almost at first it kind of catches you like it's like it's off tempo um you know, it could be when they said there's themes on the uh, album about uh you know suicide this could be that meaning that that person may need something to believe in. Uh, I, I, I love it. Uh, cause I like to think that when people are able to find that something and to believe in, then they've achieved, uh, and individualized and in the individualist status. So, uh, which I'm very pro for. So, um, yeah, absolutely love, love that song. I think it's great to uh, another punch in the face in a good way come out and play here we go this is their long view of sorts the breakthrough song right that received widespread radio play it's about gang violence uh and school violence believe it or not from dexter's travels to grad school when he was driving through east la uh, there was a, apparently the legal issues with the with the song which i never realized because there's a two-bar arabian guitar phrase the main riff throughout the song which supposedly was stated it copied from agent orange's bloodstains um agent orange was an influence on dexter uh for sure Sure. And so was that song. The Austrian manager stated that the two guitar parts were not similar and they were just based on the same scale, which in a scale, if someone bases a solo off that, you're going to have some similar notes. I've listened to it. I don't hear a blatant ripoff. Anyway, it's a good tune. It's fun. I wouldn't say it's the best, but it was super impactful because it got people's attention. Uh, Mark, come out and play. Yeah, this was definitely the one that pulled me in. Um, musically, um, moreover, punk rock didn't have to sound like this or that. And this was that song that really established that for me. Um, you know, we had the dead Kennedys earlier. Uh, we had agent orange earlier that were, that were doing different things, but this was uh, on a mainstream level of, we don't have to sound like what you tell us we have to sound like, and it's not a gimmick. Um, and that was really important. This song absolutely still holds up. Uh, lyrics, both the verse and the chorus are, are great. The band pushes it really to the limit. Um, I yeah. absolutely love this song. Um, you know, that, that energy, especially, uh, you know, when you're, when you're youth and, and you're in that high school environment and you've seen some of that violence for yourself and just the, the anger that is childhood, uh, and adolescence, uh, this song captures it and it really encompasses those feelings and those emotions. And it, it you know, it, it did a great job of pulling me back there. So, um, I, I absolutely love it. And then of course, uh, the next song. Is self esteem, which is um, what do you say about this song? Um, <laughs> I wonder if this song or she from Dookie has more to do with my self deprecating way with women. Oh. Um, yeah, I just don't know, like because they're both they're both just really fantastic songs yeah. um, about about being abused by women. Um, yeah, you know, Greg K on bass, um, bass line through this whole song just keeps the whole thing together. It's a cool part. It really pulls you through the narrative. Um, it's just such a cool song, man. And like, again, uh, just way to be personal, way to, way to be honest about uh, yourself and your feelings and whatever fucked up situation you find yourself in with relationships. <laughs> so, um, I, I really dug it. What'd you think? Yeah. So w when I first saw the video that, and that this was the next single, I was like, really? But, but man, right away, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, this is, this is immediate classic and much like basket case. Cause it's the second single of these albums that really accelerated success. I love the lyrics about the abusive relationship. I love, I wrote her off for the 10th time today. I would have loved to have done that when I was going through uh, certain relationships. We've, we've experienced that. And I know many guys do where girls just take advantage of, of the nice nature um, songs like this. This is our therapy, right? Simple chords. That's all we really needed. Listen in a car, windows down you blare out the song it's still a good feeling to this day um self-esteem man i i i at the time again i didn't get why was the single um but then shortly after i was like oh i now i know exactly why so uh great 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 tune so here we are at at track nine and we get it'll be a long time or it'll yeah it'll be a long time um you know, it, it, this is again where those albums get parallel for me. You get the massive hit, and then you get these few songs in a row that row, excuse me, that aren't bad, but maybe 
I don't want to say again fillers, but they just don't hold a candle to the beginning of the album. Uh, that's what this track is for me. Mark, uh, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I like that we were kind of back in that um, got to get away genocide um, theme and style of the song. I, I love this song as a kid. And it, it still holds up for me now. Uh, you know, it's political punk rock at its finest. It's short. It's punchy. It gets yeah. right to it. Yeah. Um, but but Frank's right. I mean, we're we're here. We're after those the the hits have subsided, and we're kind of into the back end of this record, um, where things tend to slow down a little bit and not not have quite the weight that they do in the in the front half. Yeah, um, I think that's most apparent with Killboy Powerhead. Um, <laughs> it, it's probably the low light of the album for me. Uh, musically, it just doesn't perform the way the rest of it does, and it's you know kind of compet- uh, repetitive. Excuse me, and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there was something very specific he was talking about. This is uh, definitely one of the songs about bullying he was referencing. Um, it, it, it just doesn't, you know, maybe Killboy Powerhead means something out there that it didn't mean here because uh, it, it just never connected with me. Um, you know, certainly a fun song when it's loud and fast and you're driving your car fast and you should, um, but not really, you know, nothing I've ever put on on its own. <laughs> so I, I have t- I have two... Um, two confessions to make with the song. Number one is for years, I thought it was Killboy Powderhead, which I was like, oh, it's just about someone doing coke, right? <laughs> um, that was number one. And number two, it's a cover. I had no idea it was a cover. <laughs> Oh, is it really? I'm, yeah, I'm, from this I'm band called right Yeah, from this band called The Digits, uh, D I D G I T S. So uh, it was always a low point in the album for me. And when I found out it was a cover, um, I was like, okay, yeah, it kind of makes more sense. Now, if you hear the original, the original, I'm not going to lie, I think it might be a little bit better. It's a little bit more aggressive, and uh, it, the original maybe comes off as being a little bit fun. Um, but, yeah, it was one I definitely glossed over. Um, but, you know, A, I'm glad I finally was able to read and realize I was Powerhead and not Powderhead. And then uh, when you're able to find out that it's a cover, it, is there you go. It may make more sense. So, uh, but yeah, you know, one that's just, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Then we have what happened to you, a little ska ditty on here, a uh, clock in just over two minutes. Uh, I like the don't pick it up, which we'll hear on Ixnay on the ombre, uh, which is positioned almost similar uh, to where this is positioned on this album. Uh, it's okay. Yo, it's fun. It's nice, quick and short. You're in, you're out, pretty much. Uh, Mark, what ha- what happened to you, my friend? Uh, you know, in retrospect, I feel like this is more of a preview of the albums to come. Uh, you know, with the kind of the bouncy rhythm and the not overly simple lyrics, but like the intentionally catchy, um, you know, kind of uh, attention-grabbing lyrics that don't necessarily mean anything. Um, so, not a favorite. Um, the next song, though, not the one, uh, just kind of, for me, because like, cause I'm done with, oh, no, excuse me, what am I talking about? Uh, so Alone is next. So Alone, yes. Uh, this song still rules. Um, I love, like, the, the yelling breaks where they would stop and, like, and yell. Um, I, I just, I, I think those are fun. Uh, again, this, this, for me, is, like, one of those songs that, like, if you're in the car, it's just fun to, to sing along and while you're driving way too fast. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it could even I, you know, if you had a speedometer, I would love to see if this was actually the fastest song on the album. It, it's super, super, super fast. Uh, again, it's done before you know it. Uh, the breakdown is almost thrashy too, which is kind of cool. And the yelling, uh, it's it's a cool it's a cool track. It, it inserts well, nicely into the song. Again, not like a major impact of a single, but you know, it serves its purpose absolutely. Uh, then we get the one, uh, uh, not the one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always enjoyed this tune, musically and lyrically, uh, just for regular people who go on with their lives uh, and impact individuals it's easy to think that they're not the ones contributing uh you know due to just the massive amount of you know certain behaviors um but you know i firmly believe that you just you know you treat people the way they should be treated on a daily basis as an individual and that permeates and that spreads and i like that um and uh i i've always liked this this tune and i've seen some live performances of it i think they nailed it you get the nice little uh you know um, bass riff in the beginning, the guitars come in. Uh, I like, I like not the one personally, Mark. Yeah. I, I like the song. Uh, really great. We get mid nineties political punk. I love how uh, lyrically layered the song is. I think Dexter does a, an amazing job filling the music uh, with poignant lyrics uh, that make you think about what you're doing with your life. Uh, I, I've always enjoyed this one. Um, I, I think it would have been a better ending 
uh, to the album than the actual song Smash is. Okay. Um, but I but I like the song Smash. I just feel like um, they could flop those, maybe flip flop those, maybe flip flip flop them a little bit. Um, I've always loved the chorus to the song, um, and I like the idea of of turning s- the, the idea of Smash into a lifestyle. Uh, so the, the line is Smash is the way you feel all alone, like an outcast. You're out on your own. Smash yeah. is the way you deal with your life. Um, like an outcast, you're smashing your strife. I, I, I like that concept. I like that uh, that build up and that idea of of using smash as a um, as a metaphor for how you should live. I don't know. With that said, that the the whole album fits with that theme, um, but you know maybe it does. Maybe maybe I'm not giving it enough credit, and it it does uh, the entire record kind of set a tone for how one should uh, approach their life. Um, you know, probably with the exception of, um, self-esteem, um, how we use music to, to dictate the way we live our lives. I think, um, maybe smash is, see, I'm trying to talk myself into making this a better record. Um, (laughs) um, I, 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 I like the song. I think musically it could have been somewhere else. I don't like ending the album on like this kind of slower notion. Um, especially for everything the record's done. Um, but you know, it, I've always loved the concept of it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, you know, I mean, I like it as an ending to the album. It's a song you can sing along to. I used to go around saying, I'm not in training, asshole. My mom would be like, Frank. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Frank. Like, yeah, exactly. What is it, Frank? Um, nothing out of the ordinary, again, as far as the musicality goes, but that's okay. You know, I think it's catchy. It's got the energy and, and makes you want to do what the song says to which is smash right and it's not again it's weird because we also have a hidden track here you know it, it's basically a reprise of the riff from come out and play um nothing it's kind of that ditty yeah it's a little it's a little little ditty again if you let that cd play and, and you heard this it's it's kind of fun uh, at the at the end of the day but um you know maybe not the one should have been the proper ending to the album but we get smash you know self-titled uh, tune to the album. L- listen, like Dookie brought massive success and, atten- and attention to punk. Rancid, no effects, Pennywise, they all got attention after this. It's still a classic to this day and very enjoyable to listen to. Um, whereas Green Day was already major label. The, you know, it was next Offspring album, Mixney on the Ombre, where we would see them signed to Columbia Records. Now, Dexter wanted to stay with Epitaph, uh, but their attentions when Brett decided to sell Smash to a major label in return for royalty for royalty override and the band didn't like that. Uh, Brett apo- approached several major labels to sign the Offspring, but they decided on Columbia for less money. So it wasn't all for the money for them. Um, but Mark, I mean... Uh, I got, we got a decision to make here, don't we? <laughs> we kind of do. I mean, um, you know, uh, much like uh, Dookie is for Green Day, Smash is uh, to the offspring for me. It's it's their best work. Um, the energy is there. The anger is there. And the, and the drive to do more. Um, sit down with this record uh, and really dive into it. Uh, you'll be glad you did. I think there's there's more on the surface to this record, uh, much like Dookie, than, than people give it credit for. Um, I think some of it hasn't aged perhaps quite as well as, as Dookie has aged. Mm -hmm. Um, But that said, um, you know, I, I think if you, if you can look past um, pro road rage uh, anger um, and you can also look past uh, hiding in people's closets and masturbating on their things, um, (laughs) the the records really kind of even out. It's really an odd thing. Um, You know, and perhaps I'm being a, a little bit of an apologist, uh, but uh, I don't think anything on this record is unforgivable. Um, yeah, in fact, same here. I, uh, I'd say it it, it kind of got better for me. Um, yes, you know it's 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 definitely an awesome record. It definitely holds up. Um, the problem is they both do. <laughs> that is a problem. They, I know. You know, like if 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 we're really gonna you know put these two against each other and and somebody's got to win. Uh, it's, it's a tough feat because both of these records are kick-ass. Uh, what do you think? So, you know, we did that whole 
Yeah, what were the determining factors that we did in Kerplunk and uh, Ignition, which is the opening track, the production, the sound, amount of good songs, fillers, album flow, hook songs. And I was like, yeah, I started to do that. And I was like, wait, I can't do that though with both of these because, well, then that would have to, of course, make me decide and pick a winner. Um, but it's just, you know, these are on a different stratosphere, even than Kerplunk and Ignition. And I love both of those. Um, and I thought about okay, then maybe we have to take then what's more important is the overall impact, which Dookie has or the unexpected, which smash was right. Um, because those are so impressive, right? The overall impact of Dookie is so impressive to this day. And the fact that smash just came out of nowhere and changed things is also impressive. So, uh, well, before, if we, before we get into that, I yeah, yeah, I did break down and do the scoring card like I did last time. So did I. And, and we could go through it if you want. You want to? I, not really. And I, I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because it was a difference of one point. Yeah. It's so similar. It, it, was, it was, I mean, it was, it was literally so close that I think, you know, you look at it and you go, I mean, but one point. Um, I know. I know. So it was, you know, uh, in terms of the overall impact, yeah. um, you know, I, I think for something like that, for me, it goes to Green Day. Yeah. Um, I think certainly, you know, pop punk is definitely a direct derivative of that, uh, of, of this record, excuse me. Um, and I, I don't think you can say that about a style of music for the offspring, right. short of the following offspring records, which turned into their own thing. Um, well, not Ixnay. I, I do enjoy Ixnay on the album. Ixnay's great. Yeah, fantastic um, album. You know, but... Um, so I, I think Green Day has a little bit of an edge there, and, and yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to surprise anybody. Green Day had the, the point advantage in my scoring. I'm I just want to like them both equally. I, Me too. You know, I'm really fighting this. Yeah. Like, I, do I think I should say Dookie is the winner? I, I think so. Do I want it to be a tie? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I'm going to say an answer without giving an answer. Also, you know, I I went through. Uh, Looking back as to the notes, then I wrote, I mean, Green Day had the the slight edge and maybe it was that impact that put them over the edge as opposed to an album that just came out of nowhere. Uh, and I did score Ignition higher than Kerplunk. So then I guess I could give the edge to Dookie on that. Um, but I love both records. Um, I'm not saying I don't like one over really the other, but if you have to pick one maybe on the impact, then then maybe it's Dookie. But I'll backtrack real quick saying I still love both records and they're both awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm sorry, and, and I agree with you. It's it's such a – this is a really tough call. I mean, this is um, two records from, from very much 1994 yeah. um, that still very much hold up today, that still very much exist in the world that they existed in. And, um, you know, you get one that's uh, a little more political facing, a little bit more um, do something uh, with your life and, and, you know, make a change in Smash. Uh, and you get one that's maybe a little more self-deprecating uh, and a little bit more honest about how we feel in our, our, yeah. ourselves and Dookie. Um, you know, it's... <sighs> They're both great. Check them both out. Yeah. If, you, if anyone who hasn't, if anyone, because you're listening to you know, American Idiot or, or Americana, please go back and listen to these, please, because yeah. they're, they're just incredible. Hey, just while we're, while we're at it, and, and we'll exclude the album that just came out, sure. what do you think are the worst albums from each of these bands? Oh man, that's such that's such a good question. Such a good question because I I love Insomniac and I I love Ixne on the Ombre. Um, I'm actually a big fan of Warning from Green Day uh, just because I I really think it's it's different. Uh, people dismissed it right away early on, but I think there's some really good hidden gems on there. Um, of course, you have American Idiot. Um, if I had to pick the worst from Green Day, I, I would probably say it's that, uh, and, and we're excluding the last album, of course, I would probably say it's that trio of Uno, Do, and Trey in 2012, just because it was, it was too much going on. Then they could have made one cohesive album, a lot of filler in there. And they're like, oh, it's, you know, each album represents a different sound. It all sounded the same to me, uh, especially Do and Trey. Um, so from Green Day, you, you probably have me on that one or the 21st century breakdown, which was them trying to recreate American idiot. Um, yeah, I would say those, one of those two. What about you, Mark on green day? 
you know, for and, and I'll admit, there's a lot of this that um, that I've really just I I just checked out on. Uh, certainly after warning, I I really just kind of went. No, it's cool. I'm just going to stick with what I know. Yeah. Um, but from what I have, uh, American Idiot for me is just it's it's a terrible concept album. It is it's just not good. Um, and the fact that it was the the success it was is is almost offensive to songwriters. Um, <laughs> You know, well, I, I just don't. I don't think it had the the weight and the and the earnest that the the earlier albums had. And I think it started this trend of just just shit. Um, you know, I, I just couldn't. I, I just can't do it. I just that that record makes me angry every time. We might have to then dedicate an eventual uh, episode to it. But you know, it's funny you say that because I, I, I know I'm so sorry. But I was thinking about okay, albums I was totally in love with at the time, and now looking back, I was one of those okay, what was I thinking? And American Idiot, it could be one of those for me, just because when I heard it through, I was like, oh man, I was like, this is it was. I thought it was well put together um, but I think what impressed me more because I think this is still impressive even though we don't necessarily love the album and Dookie is better but it, how it uh, rejuvenated their career because in the morning they were written off as a nostalgia act and then they be, like they became you know the the black uh, you know the, the the black shirt and black pants and red tie wearing Green Day with their with their uh, makeup on you know and it, it was just crazy how huge then that became um, I I do think the ones after it if you were to hear it you you might say American Idiot is slightly better even though it's not your favorite but um, you know I, yeah Dookie Dookie is way better than American Idiot at the end of the day <laughs> and and now of course Offspring so you know Americana and pretty white pretty fly for a white guy, excuse me. And, and the, why don't you get a job? And they were trying to be like kind of hip and cool and a conspiracy of one after that kind of had the song American prankster, uh, which I believe had Redmond in it, you know? So they were, they were really, I think trying to appeal to that after then I kind of lost track with, I believe the, the three albums that they had, I know they re-recorded dirty magic on one of them, um, which I still like the original better. Uh, if I had a pick, though out of the ones at least I heard it, it might be uh, Americana because it was still in that late 90s and, you know, I loathe that time for music. Uh, what, what about you, Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say Conspiracy for one, of one. Right. Um, you know, I, I feel like Americana hit me when I was like, I was the right age for it in 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's still some good punk songs on there. Yeah, and it was cheeky in the right places and, it you know, like it... Um, it, it was all right. You know, it, it was very much a, a sign of the times, you know, pre fly for a white guy and all that crap. Yeah. Um, you know, she's got issues. Um, yeah. You know, um, it, it had its moments, but at the same time, uh, conspiracy of one was just a slog. It, it just felt really um, contrite and, and, and boring. Um, original prankster was really them trying to recreate pretty fly for a white guy, you know, it was kind of that. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and the rest of the album is just so forgettable. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was one of those things. Uh, it's amazing to me how both of these bands just like had like one, ha- had enough material for one more record and then just pumped out a ton of shit. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah. Because again, Insomniac and, and Nick and the Ombre, good, good records, mm-hmm. really good records. Um, and it, that, those were following massive successes too. And then Green Day, keep in mind, still, yes, Nimrod had uh, Good Riddance Time of Your Life on it, and it had nineteen something songs. But I still like that album. I personally like Nimrod, and the, the Morning was still good. So uh, it's just interesting the past they go on, and maybe we need to do then episodes where we kind of gloss over them, not necessarily just kind of uh you know just talk about american idiot for an hour and a half but just kind of gloss then over as to now where they're at but definitely interesting stuff to think about right mark yeah yeah and you can find frank doing that by himself on youtube <laughs> oh. so, uh, I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding if you, if you want to do it buddy we can do it um, <laughs> you know well. it's it's definitely interesting to look at their careers after their their massive hits um yeah. you know i i think if anything uh, maybe maybe further down the line we can we can do uh, <laughs> insomniac versus Ixnay. Yeah, it's not a bad um, idea. Not a bad idea. And just and just look at like you know with with insomniac being such a like a middle finger to those people who told them that they had sold out. You know what was 
what was the response for Ixnay on the Ombre as the yeah. first major label? How did that go over? How does it compare? Because uh, it, it's it's a great record. It still holds up. Um, you know, I, I had fun listening to that after I listened to this a, first few, t- a, a few times just to kind of get that feeling for it. Um, and, and to me, it's it's still kind of a very fun record. It's it's still very much the offspring. You get a lot of that, that attitude in there, and it's great. So... Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, you know, with Insomniac, you know, here here they are. They release just angry song, Greek Geek Stink Breath. You know, they release Brain Stew, followed by a short, really super punky song, Jaded. Uh, there's some other gems in here. Like I, I mentioned this once before, but Stuart and the Avidu, freaking fantastic, man. And if you could catch a live performance of it, uh, it's freaking awesome. Stuck with me. Just a lot of good stuff. And Ixnay, you know, they're the first single from from Ixnay was all I want. That song, I think it's like under two minutes. I mean, it's, that's, that's crazy. Um, you get gone away, which is a, a massive, almost self-esteem style type hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I choose, which shows a little bit more popular side, but I mean, great, great album, man. Meaning of life, me and my old lady, cool to hate, just, just good stuff overall. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool, cool. Well, Mark, are you ready for what we're doing next? Is it the hokey pokey? It is, yes, yes. Then you turn yourself around and, that's what it's all about, my friend. And you recommended St. Paul and the Broken Bones to me last time, so it's my recommendation to you. Mm-hmm. We're going to get a little indie folk here and take a trip to the woods with Lord Hurons, or Hurons, I guess, however you're, wherever you're from and that you're, however the accent uh, takes it. Uh, but it's their sophomore release. That's 2015 Strange Trails. It's been one of my most recent uh, favorite album since I heard it back in 2015. The lead singer Ben Schneider really takes us on a visual story. It's themed both lyrically and musically. Uh, the band makes an effort to really enhance the sounds of the instruments, and I personally feel it's created some of my favorite tracks thus far. So, Mark, I, I hope you like it. I hope you don't cloud nothings it, and I verb to cloud nothings on there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're gonna get a little Indian folky, and uh, I, I hope you like Strange Trails. All right, we're going to check it out. Uh, would you would you classify this as a concept album for those playing along at home? I know that's my first question out of the gate. Yeah, so and and I think that's what what Ben does a lot. So the the first album was one of those kind of um, Western tales, so to speak. This album uh, was uh, more set kind of in in the woods and the whole themat uh, you know theatrical kind of side of that. And then the last one was more of like a stargazer album where it talks about lakes and the stars in the sky. Uh, I think this is a themed album. Now maybe there there's not a hundred percent consistency with the songs or it doesn't take you on a character and flow that way, but you're going to hear melodies like in the beginning of the record. And then they're going to come back and circle back around in the middle. And then towards the end where you're almost going to be like, wait, didn't he do that? But, but there's a purpose behind it. Um, and like I said, then everything's kind of centered around the dark, the woods. Um, you're get, you're going to hear certain, really kind of certain tones that are accented. He he did a lot of listening to like what Bo Diddley was doing uh, on guitars and tones. So really focused on that. Um, so maybe it's like kind of a partial concept album, um, but I, I, I really, yeah, really yeah. interested to, to hear what you think about it. Cool. I'm looking forward to listening to it. And uh, again, folks, if, uh, if you find us uh, on your, your podcatcher or you're listening to us on YouTube, uh, click the thumbs up or the five star or the 200 hearts. Um, yes. If you run into me on breath of the wild, uh, give me lots of food. I haven't really had time to play my Nintendo switch lately, but uh, um, is that a thing you can do? I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how the <laughs> multiplayer works on that game. Um, but no, uh, like us, uh, write a little review, uh, tell your friends. If you hate us, definitely tell people you don't like to listen to us. Yes. Um, and uh, have a great uh, have a great day, pal. You're doing wonderful out there. We believe in you. Uh, yes. Frank thinks you're kind of a dick, but I think you're a good guy. So um, you can you can pull through. And I'm not sure who I'm talking to. Um, I just wanted to I just wanted to make somebody's day better. Yeah, absolutely, and I know that's what we did for everyone too: is make people's day better. And like Mark said, you can find us on all those avenues. Uh, we'll be back with another episode soon. We got some cool stuff coming up, and thank you everyone for listening. So have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.